2010, a book came out that was reported to have lied about the atomic bombings from Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the United States perspective. Well, I knew a true story, so I had to start writing. My grandfather, Jacob Beezer, was the only man on board both the airplanes that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But by coincidence, my other grandfather was actually friends with someone who survived Hiroshima. I met her when I was a child. We keep her identity hidden now. But I asked her family if they would work with me when I found out about this not true book. But they said no. We can be your friends, they told me, but if you want to write a book about the atomic bombings, you have to meet Hibakusha, the, the survivors, the atomic bomb survivors. You have to meet as many as you can before it's too late because they're rapidly passing away. So for the last six years, that's what I've been doing. I've been seeking out these Hibakusha, asking them to tell me their stories and inheriting their messages to send to the next generation. When I found out about the Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellowship, I knew that I had to piece their stories together with the nuclear refugees from Fukushima. The first thing I learned about all of this is that war is extremely difficult to talk about. Everybody has their own version of the truth that they believe in. If, if you look at World War II, it's no different. Let's pretend we're Japanese. Let's pretend we're Japan. We're watching Western powers take over Asia. We have stayed isolated for 150 years to keep our identity, our religion, our culture, our way of life pure and surviving. And we grew. And we were able to defend ourselves, and we did. But the United States said we couldn't. And they put an embargo on us and sanctions. Should we give up, or should we do something? So that's how Tokyo viewed World War II. They had no choice, they thought. They had to attack Pearl Harbor. You have to understand that this is the mentality. It's not necessarily that I agree with this or think this. It's just that I wanted to understand where they were coming from. President Obama ignored the political backlash and the misunderstandings about apologies when he went to Hiroshima, the first president to do so. He knew he wasn't coming there to apologize. That's not what we do. He came to reflect on humanity's ability to destroy itself. And he spoke to a carefully selected audience of Hibakusha, many of whom were my friends. Ito-san was there. Ito-san's brother was killed in the bombing when he was 10. He was evacuated to the countryside like many 10-year-olds. And then, decades later, his worst fears were brought to life again when he watched a plane crash into his son's office building on September 11th. For many years, he was angry, bitter. But a Buddhist priest, a friend of his, taught him how to let that go. And now when Ito-san speaks, he teaches people the same. Mori-san was there. Mori-san's elementary school was across the street from the regional police headquarters in Hiroshima. He knew for a fact that American prisoners of war were kept there and killed in the bombs. But their identities were kept hidden. They're, they were never admitted to have been there. He sought out their identities, and he kept researching for years and years and years to seek who they were, just to know who they were, just to contact their families, just to tell them what had happened. And eventually, it was declassified. Their identities were revealed. We recognized them. And President Obama hugged him after his speech. Koko-san wasn't in the audience, but she, like the rest of the world, was listening to Obama speak. And she swore she heard this familiar story and that it had to be her. When, a, when President Obama said, the woman who forgave the pilot, that was Koko. Koko's father, Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto, was the mastermind behind the Hiroshima Maidens Project, the 25 girls that were brought to the United States to receive reconstructive surgery to heal their scars from the bomb. One of them was actually my grandfather's friend. He was the mastermind behind the Hiroshima Maidens Project, and Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimori was featured on This Is Your Life, where he was introduced to Robert Lewis, the co-pilot. Coco had these feelings of revenge. She wanted to do something to him when she met him at the tender age of 10. But when she saw him, he had tears in his eyes. She told me that he just, we were the same human heart, nothing more, and 
nothing less. I spent about five months living in Fukushima. I learned what happens when a nuclear power plant fails and you have to leave and you don't know where to go and you don't know where you're coming back and you don't know if you've been exposed. You don't know how much you've been exposed to or if you have been exposed at all. But you've got that anxiety. I went into Futaba with Yuji Onuma, his hometown. Yuji in middle school came up with a slogan in a contest promoting nuclear power plants, nuclear energy. His slogan, it won. Nuclear energy is the power of a bright future. Nuclear power is the energy of a bright future, he wrote. And for years, that sign, that sign stood proudly in the main street. And then, ironically, when the town was abandoned. Now, Yuji is a nuclear activist, an anti-nuclear activist. And he has built a solar farm for his new home so that they can be off the grid and not reliant on nuclear power anymore. Every time, every time I interview someone from Fukushima, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, I just think, what would I do if it was me? What would I do? Keiko, she drove to her home because she was at her daughter's graduation when the earthquake struck. She was the only car on the road. Everybody else was driving away from the disaster, but she didn't know what had happened. When she got home, her neighbor who worked at the plant said there was an explosion at the plant, not a meltdown, but an explosion. So she had to leave. I think about Kenta Sato, whose town is not in the exclusion zone, but received Chernobyl-level radiation in Itate. Now he stares at his property. And those black bags, that's the topsoil from his farmlands. But do not call it trash. That's not trash, he says. That's the soil my ancestors spent generations, thousands of years cultivating, enriching, and, build, and growing delicious fruit and vegetables. That's, that's not trash. It's my identity, he said. And I think about how, I think about how to survive an atomic bomb and how duck and cover actually saved John Kun Lee's life, but after the bombs, he had to hide his atomic bomb survivor identity and his Korean one, because both communities face discrimination in Japan. And I think about Sakue Shimohira, whose brother returned to Nagasaki, where he warned her, Hiroshima was destroyed after the all clear. If there's an, if there's an air raid warning, don't go outside, even after the all clear warning. She was 800 meters from the hypocenter of the bomb. And she listened to her brother's advice and survived. And I think about Stomo Yamaguchi. He was working in Hiroshima as a ship designer. Him and his coworkers were walking to work. They were discussing about buying their train tickets home on August 7th. Should we reserve them or should we just get them there? Oh, we should just get them there. But that's when he realized he forgot his stamp, his name stamp. So he had to run back to his dorm and get it. And on his way back to his office, everybody was already inside and safe in the factory, and he was in the fields. And he saw parachutes falling from, the ground, from, the, from an airplane. But before he could think about what it was, he just survived the first atomic attack on people. And he escaped. And he went home. And he told his coworkers what had happened at the engineering plant. One plane destroyed one city with one bomb. Stomason, you're a technician. You should know that's not possible, they said. And then that's when the second bomb went off in Nagasaki. And his first thought was that the mushroom clouds are following me. From my understanding, the Fulbright program is actually in jeopardy. The current administration believes that we need to keep our country secure by building up our military defenses. But I argue that a strong cultural exchange does build up our defenses. We can fight misunderstandings. We can learn from each other. In the Fulbright program alone, I went to a convention where I helped volunteer. And I met people from Morocco, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Palestine, from India, from Turkey, from all over the world, where we could disagree with each other peacefully and learn about what we think. My grandfather did not feel bad about what he did, never expressed guilt, but he said that we have to figure out a way to get along or it's going to happen again. And it's happening again. I'm really worried. I'm, I'm terrified that 
we're forgetting the messages of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Fukushima, or, or even worse, we're misinterpreting them. Stomi Yamaguchi's family told me to send his message everywhere I go. He used to say that we're living in a time where we listen to the loudest and the most radical people, and we think that they're right. World War II is the same way, but we know what is right. We know it's true. Even if the truth starts out as a whisper, we have to keep telling it. The truth transcends borders. So if we can imagine that world without war, and that world where we rid ourselves of that last nuclear weapon, then we have to work together and achieve it. One day, I'm going to tell my grandchildren that my grandfather was the only man in the world that was on both planes that dropped the atomic bombs. And their grandfather, he was sent by the governments of the United States and Japan who worked together to send a message of reconciliation and nuclear disarmament. That's, I'll tell them, how peace works. Thank you. <laughs>